Good morning, everyone, and I hope you are doing well. You probably will have heard by now that restrictions have lifted somewhat, and so we are able to be meeting in person again. And so next week on July the 4th, that'll be the first Sunday that we'll be meeting together again here in the building for an in-person worship service. So you are more than welcome to join us for that, and I hope you're able to come out. Just mark on your calendar uh, July the 4th, and our service starts at 1045. We're going to conclude our series this morning on the seven letters to the seven churches. Before we do that, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessing of being able to meet again. We thank you for that. We've been praying for it, Lord, and we are overjoyed uh, to be able to gather together again. So we thank you for that. We thank, Lord, of our farmers out there who are in desperate need of rain. Lord, the ground is dry, and we just pray that uh, you would please bless us with some rain in this area. Lord, as we look into your word now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, do a work in our hearts and just, just speak to us, Lord. I pray that as we look at this letter, we would ask ourselves if there's anything in here that uh, applies to us that we can apply to our own lives. Maybe we see ourselves in this letter in a, little, in a, in a certain way. So, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, guide and direct us in this time and open our hearts and our minds to whatever it is that you would uh, teach us and have us learn. So, we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, the book of Revelation and the third chapter. It would be nice to end our series on a high note, but unfortunately that is not going to be the case. We're going to look at the letter to the church of Laodicea. And the letter to the church of Laodicea was not a very pleasant letter. Uh, this is, in fact, the only letter out of, out of the seven letters. This is the only one where the Lord has nothing good to say. There is no commendation. There is only condemnation. Uh, it is not a very pleasant letter. If our church uh, could be the recipient of any one of the seven letters that we have looked at, uh, this is probably the last one that we would want to be receiving here. It is the worst, it is the worst of all the seven. The Lord, He speaks uh, to this church with words that are both condemning and harsh. There is no beating around the bush here whatsoever. He's very straightforward with them about what he sees. Perhaps the reason he speaks uh, to the church in such a forthright manner, and why he is uh, so critical of them, why his words are so harsh, uh, is because he's trying to jolt them. He's trying to jolt them into repenting. Uh, he is trying to wake them up from their very troublesome state. So we're going to read the letter together, and this is Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on His throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Now, I have taken this text, verses 14 to 22, and I have divided them up into three sections. And so if you're taking notes at all, there will be three points for you this morning. The first one we'll look at a little bit longer, and then we will look briefly at the second and third point. The first point is the state of the church. The state of of the church. And when we speak of the state of the church, we are talking about the state of the Laodicean church, which was by no means good, as you can probably gather from the letter. The state of this church is so bad, actually, that in verse 16, the Lord says, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You may have had the occasion at some point to take a drink of something, and you didn't realize that it was terribly disgusting until it hits your taste buds and you realize this is really bad and you just want to spit it out as fast as you possibly can. Uh, I had that happen to me once. I, I, went, I was at someone's house and I went to their fridge and I poured myself a glass of milk because I was really thirsty. I took a drink of the, of the milk. I filled my mouth with it and I didn't realize how foul it truly was. And I spit it out as soon as I was able to find a, con a, a convenient place to do so. And then for curiosity's sake, I went and checked the uh, expiry date on the milk and I discovered that it had expired approximately two to three months uh, prior. It was terrible. It was terrible. And you just wanted to spit it out. I just wanted to spit it out of my mouth as fast as I possibly could. That's what's going on here in regards to the church of Laodicea. That is the Lord's reaction. Uh, Jesus, he, he is saying here essentially, you make me so sick that I just want to throw up. The Laodiceans, uh, they probably would have had a pretty good idea of what the Lord was talking about here. They could identify with this. Uh, the city of Laodicea, it did not have good water. It didn't have good water for drinking. Other places nearby did, but they did not. And so they decided to fix the problem by building an aqueduct to where there was good water, and then they were just getting the water uh, from there to flow into the city. Uh, the problem was, though, that the water that was flowing in, it had to go through pipes, and on the way, it was contaminated. And so they never really did so solve the problem. The water of the city was bad and the water that they were getting uh, brought in via the aqueduct, by time it reached the city, it too was bad. So they didn't win really at all. One commentator, he wrote this of their situation. Hierapolis to the north enjoyed hot springs useful for healing, while Colossae to the east had cold, refreshing drinking water. But Laodicea received its water from a spring about five miles to the south. By the time this mineral-rich water made its way over the Roman aqueduct to Laodicea, it had become lukewarm and disgusting to drink. This is the kind of water that would have made a person sick. And potentially, when someone took, put it in their mouth to drink it, they just wanted to spit it out. It was that disgusting. And this is how Jesus is feeling towards the church of Laodicea. This is a church that makes him sick, and he wants to spit them out. One author in his book on uh, this letter, uh, he calls it triggering the divine gag reflex. That is what the church church in Laodicea has done. They are triggering the divine gag reflex. And they are doing that by way of what we see in verses 15 and 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, the word that is used here to, de to describe the church of Laodicea is the word lukewarm. I personally don't care for it much myself. Of course, my name is Luke. And the word lukewarm, as we find it in this context, it's not exactly an endearing term. 
we have to ask the question, what exactly does the Lord mean by lukewarm? We had this issue when we came to the church of Sardis. The Lord referred to the church of Sardis as a dead church. Well, we asked the question, what does a dead church look like? Well, it's the same question that we are presented with here. What does a lukewarm church look like? And the first answer to that question just comes simply from the text. Well, it is obviously a church that is neither hot nor cold. And when we think of a church that is hot, uh, we might think of a church that is really on fire for the Lord. Uh, we think of the early disciples. We think of the Apostle Peter. We think of the Apostle Paul, men who turned the world upside down, men who were faithful, men who were spirit-filled. They were committed. They were spiritually alive. That's what we might think of when we think of uh, a church that is hot. Then we might think of spiritually cold. What, what does spiritually cold look like? Well, we might think of atheists or agnostics. Uh, we would probably put them into that category. Uh, they may know that they are sinners, but they have no use whatsoever for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They may go so far as to even mock the Lord. These are people who are spiritually cold. I was talking with a fellow just the other day uh, about the song, Amazing Grace, and about the man who wrote the song, John Newton. And John Newton, for those of you uh, who don't know, he was a preacher, he was a pastor, uh, but before that, in his younger years, in his late teens, in his early 20s, well, he served as a slave trader. He was actually at one point the captain of a slave ship. Uh, he was a vile man. He was a, he was a violent man. He would blaspheme. He was immoral. Uh, he was a wicked man. He actually said of himself, he wrote this years later about this time in his life. The Lord had, by all appearances, given me up to judicial, judicial hardness. I was capable of anything. I had not the least fear of God before my eyes, nor, so far as I remember, the least sensibility of conscience." I was possessed with so strong a spirit of delusion that I believed my own lie and was firmly persuaded that after death I should cease to be. This was a man who was very much spiritually cold. Fortunately, by the grace of God, uh, what was cold became hot. The church in Laodicea, they were neither. They were not hot, they were not cold, they were lukewarm. Considering the fact that the Lord is writing to the church, I think it is safe to say that He is speaking to those who consider themselves to be His followers. Uh, they are not, though. They are self-deceived, which is arguably the worst thing that can happen to a person, is for them to be thinking that they are spiritually alive, when in fact they are spiritually dead. These are people who probably sat in church on Sunday, who put money in the offering plate. They don't publicly reject the Lord. That is what the cold people would do, those who are spiritually cold. These don't, they don't reject the Lord. They're okay with religion. But deep down, they don't know the Lord. Deep down, they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They think probably that God is happy with them, that they are good people. Uh, God's not interested in quote-unquote good people, though He's interested in redeemed faithful people. That is what He cares about. John MacArthur, uh, he wrote this in his uh, commentary on the subject. The church today is overrun with men and women who have never repented and believed savingly in the Lord, but are nonetheless convinced they are right with God and will not receive His judgment. Some of these people sit under the teaching of God's Word week after week, unmoved by its truth and unaware of the true condition of their hearts. They don't believe they remain lost lost in their sins. There's not much you could say or do to convince them of their need of the Savior. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we in this category of lukewarm, uh, lukewarm, I don't want to use the word Christian, 
because they're not, but lukewarm people who confess to know Christ, but do not. Uh, there is a thinking in Christian circles that you're not supposed to doubt your salvation. You're not supposed to question it. I don't really adhere to that at all. I think that it is, uh, it is good to ask yourself, am I actually in the faith? Now, I don't think you should be questioning it on a daily basis or anything like that. Uh, you, could, you should come to some resolution on the question, but you are to take an honest look at yourself and ask, am I in the faith? And we know this. The Apostle Paul, he said as much in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. The devil would like nothing more than someone to sit in a pew, than someone to sit in a chair in church their entire lives every Sunday, uh, but not actually come to the Lord, and them just thinking that they're okay with the Lord, and that they're good, and that they're not going to receive His judgment. The devil is perfectly fine with that. If you're self-deceived, he's okay with that. He'd prefer it. Verse 17. It gives us further insight into this lukewarm church's self-deception. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. These are people who thought they were spiritually rich. They don't realize what they are really like, though. In their minds, they don't need help with anything at all. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. These are people who don't need anything. In their minds, anyways. They don't need any help. They're good just like they are. I think again of the song, the hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. That's John Newton reflecting on the way that he was. Lost, blind. Now that sounds a lot like this Laodicean church here. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. John Newton, he famously said, I know I'm a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. This was a man who recognized his wretchedness, who recognized what he was truly like, and recognized his need for the Lord. The people in Laodicea, they don't seem to recognize their sinful state here. They don't, they don't view themselves as being in any need of help. They're okay. They're good as they are. And that is a very difficult person to try and reach. You're probably better off trying to reach the atheist for the Lord than someone like this. Very difficult group of people to win for the Lord. That is the state of the Laodicean church, if you will. Secondly, we have the need of the church. The need of the church. In light of the true spiritual condition of this church, which Christ here, he's trying to draw their attention to, the fact that they are pitiful, blind, and so on. He has specific instruction for them, and we read about that in verses 18 and 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so, that, so you can see. Those whom I love Love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. The people of Laodicea, if you know the history of this city, this is a very wealthy city actually, very wealthy. Uh, they were financially well off. 
Very much so. And the believers there, the, the so-called believers, uh, they seem to think that they were equally wealthy in regards to their spirituality, which simply was not the case. That's what Christ is offering them here, a spiritual wealth, worth far more than any gold that one might expect to get from a mine or to dig from the ground. MacArthur, he wrote, The people of Laodicea would have been familiar with gold to understand the great value of what Christ was offering here. This spiritual gold had been refined and purged of impurities. It was perfect and priceless, especially when compared to the physical gold they so highly prized. The Laodiceans trusted in their vast wealth. Christ offered them the true spiritual riches of salvation and a right relationship with Him. So that is the first thing that Christ tells them they need. They need gold refined in the fire so that they can become rich. The second thing that He tells them that they need here, remember we're talking about the need of this church. The second thing is garments to cover their nakedness. White garments, white garments that signify the righteousness of Christ. The city of Laodicea, they were famous for making clothing. They had wool that they would dye black and they would use it to make, uh, they would use it to make clothing. Christ is saying you don't need black clothes, which in, in many circles would signify sin. Which would be a fitting, uh, which would be fitting in this case. You don't need black clothes. You need white clothes, referring probably to the righteousness of Christ here that we are clothed clothed with at the time of salvation. The prophet Isaiah here. This is Isaiah 61 and verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of His righteousness. These robes here that we read about in Isaiah, they are arguably the white robes that the Lord refers to in Revelation, in His letter to the church of Laodicea. These are the robes that the church is in, that the so-called church is in need of. Robes of salvation, robes of righteousness. The church, another thing that they need, there are three things they need. They need gold, they need garments, they also need to see. They also need to see because they are spiritually blind. As John Newton wrote, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. The church, the people of Laodicea, who were identifying as the church, they needed to have their eyes open, the spiritual blinders removed. They needed to see. This is the transformation that the church in Laodicea needs here. This is a church, overall, this is a church in desperate, desperate need. They don't realize how much need they are in. They think they're okay, but they're not. They're in desperate, desperate need. In their lukewarmness, they think they're just fine, everything's all right. It's not the case. And Christ, He loves them enough to point out their need. He loves them enough to call them to repentance, which is what He does in verse 19. 19 he says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So repent. Repent. It's out of His love that He is calling them to repent. I think of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is because of His love that He came, He provided a way of salvation, and He calls us to repent. It's because of His love that He was calling the Laodicean church. To repent. A point number three. A point number three. The hope of the church. We've looked at the state of the church, the need of the church, and now, lastly, the hope of the church. The hope of this church is that they would become regenerate, regenerate, that they would actually become the true church, that their lives would be transformed, that they wouldn't remain in their state of poverty. 
their state of nakedness, uh, their state of blindness. Verse 20, Here I am, this is Jesus speaking. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Uh, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus Christ was outside of this church. He wasn't in it. He was outside. That is, a very, uh, that is a very disturbing thought almost, to think that you can have a church building full of people, uh, every chair filled, every pew full, everyone's there except for Jesus. He's not there. He's outside. Wanting to be let in. That is what we read about in the text here. And you might be, uh, you might recognize that picture. Uh, it's a very old picture of Jesus knocking on a door, and the door, the door knob is actually, it's, it's not in the door handle, it's not on the outside, it's on the inside, because it can only be opened from the inside. And Jesus is knocking on the outside, and he's saying, Let me in. He's standing on the outside in His goodness and in His mercy. He doesn't have to be. But because of who He is, because of His love for us, He is standing there knocking and saying, Let me in. Let me in. Let me in and we can have fellowship and intimacy. That is the benefit that can be received in the here and the now. Fellowship and intimacy with the Lord. That is what happens at the time of salvation. That, was what, that is what we grow in as we journey along through our Christian lives. He's going to come in and eat with that person and they with me. That describes fellowship. This is what is available for each one of us. That is the benefit that can be received in the here and now. For those who, are repent, who repent and are made spiritually rich, who repent, they're given garments of white, and they're given eyes that see. There are also, though, the benefits that are not received now, but will only be realized, that will only be enjoyed, that will only be experienced when we cross over the other side and we spend eternity with Christ. In heaven, that is where, arguably, that is where most of the benefits will be received. Where there will be no more crying, there will be no more pain, be no more tears, uh, no more death, no more temptation, no more sin, no more evil. Where we will be like Him, where we will see Him as He is. Heaven is going to be a place where we enjoy many, many unthinkable uh, benefits. Verse 21, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on His throne. One of the benefits, and that which we read about in this verse is the promise of reigning with Christ forever and ever throughout all eternity. This is what is meant by the terminology, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Scripture elsewhere speaks of this. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Reigning with Christ that is what is promised here in this verse to the one who is victorious. And as we have seen elsewhere throughout all the other letters, we see whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This letter and the letters that we have looked at thus far, they were addressed to certain churches. They are made available for us today. What was said to them, we are to read, we are to learn from, we are to apply to our own lives. And in the case of the letter to Laodicea, do not be lukewarm. 
Don't be cold either. It would be better if you were cold than lukewarm. But be hot. Be a people who love and serve the Lord. Be faithful to Him. That is our series on the letters to the seven churches. Next week, we are going to go back to the Old Testament. We were in the Old Testament before when we looked at the book of Job. Uh, we've been in the New Testament here now for almost two months, and we are going to be in uh, we are going to be in the Old Testament again here, and we're probably going to look at the, at the book of 1 Samuel. So that, uh, I, uh, I hope you're able to join us for that next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, uh, we come before you now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who wrote these letters so many years ago. Father, I pray that there would not be anyone listening here now who is lukewarm. I pray, Father, that if there be someone who is, that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would recognize their spiritual depravity, uh, that they would recognize their need for you, that they would know, that they would realize that they are a great sinner and that they need a great Savior. And we thank you that you are that great Savior. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people uh, who love you, uh, who want to serve you with all of our hearts, Lord. Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity that we have to meet together again next week. And as we look into your word again then, we pray that you would uh, just continue to speak to our hearts, Lord, from your word that you have given to us. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.